I'm going to go. Praise God. So this is Biblical Finances. This is the third third session. Um, last week, I spoke about the foundations of um, finances from a biblical standpoint. But basically, we are stewards. We are stewards of God's money. Our money is not our money. It's God's money. We're just looking after it for a period of time. And when you have that mindset, it changes the whole way you think about money, the whole way you look about money. Um, you know, your, your whole relationship with money changes when you realize this is God's money. This is God's money. And, um, and I, I'm just looking after it for a season and everything goes back to God when I'm finished with it. The second session was about actually how to, um, how to be, a, be a good steward of, of the money I have how to make the most of it. Um, I went into things like budgeting. I went into um, just, just, just the, the mindset of, you know what, I want to be a good steward with this money. I want to be faithful, faithful as much as I possibly can with this money. And I want to make the most out of it. And I believe that when you're faithful with money, with what you have, again, back to Moses, God said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? He didn't say to Moses, what don't you have? Or what would you like? He said, what do you have? And lay it down for me. And I believe that's what God asks of us financially, that what do we have? And we lay it down for him. It doesn't mean we give him all of the money we have. We, you know, we just give it away. No, it means that we, we um, our will with the money, we lay it down and say, Lord, whatever you want to do with it, I am willing to do with it. And so, praise God. So let me just share a couple of things on my screen. And if, if, if this is on audio, then I will... Um, I oh, would just, just listen and you can see. But I just want to share these two things because some people ask me um, some books. So I'm, I'm recommending just two books today, just two books. So this one, Financial Stewardship by Andrew Womack. Um, this is a real, um, again, biblically, if you want to come across finances from a biblical standpoint, this is a great book. This is a great book. This book is a great influence on the teaching I was doing on being a steward. And, um, you know, th so this book here is a fantastic teaching on biblical finances. And so I would highly recommend that. It's a very, um, you could say, is it theological viewpoint of finances um, for that understanding. The next one I want to recommend is this one here, Your Money or Your Life by a lady called Vicky Robin and also with a man called Joe Dominguez. Your money or your life. It's nine steps to transforming your relationship with money and achieving financial independence. Basically, this, this book is a very, very practical book. Incredibly practical. practical. It's been around for years and um, it's very challenging. I think if you, if you have these two books together, um, you've got the Andrew Womack one on like strong biblical biblical. Uh, mindset towards money and this book as well which um, the lady does, does not say that she's an outright a Christian in the book but she does, does talk about giving within the book um, this is really good sound financial advice um, it, it will make you think about things differently there are many other books I can recommend but I think these two will go well together I know I spoke on Sunday with, with somebody and they said which book would you recommend this yellow one and the Andrew Womack one are two that I'd recommend. Also, the two applications I recommended. This one, YNAB. It's, so you can see up here, you need a budget.com. You need a budget.com. Um, this is one of the best. I've tried different ones. This is, if, you know, if you want to use a computer and a, and a phone, an app on your phone and a computer together, this is one of the best ones I've found. You can try them for free for 34 days. After that, I think you pay, I think, £10 a month. It does come at a cost, this one, which puts a lot of people off. But I, I, I'm telling you, if you invest in it, and if you're not used to budgeting, this will save you so much money and give you so much control over your money. And they're very good because they have, um, that's their software there. But also they have training videos, tips, um, testimonies, or different things. It's, it's, it's actually very, very good, that one. So um, it's more than just an application. Um, it's, it's actually videos and just trying to educate you on finances. It's very, very good. Um, so I recommend that one. And this one here, uh, this is an app only. This is called Emma. And Emma is just good. 
Well, well, one of the things that you miss from YNAB is you cannot link the application to your bank account. Some people like to do that. That's America only for YNAB. Um, the rest of it fits with the UK perfectly. But Emma is an app that, that, that can link with your bank account. And what it will do, it will, it will buzz you on your phone and says, this money's come out, that money's come out. So you can really track where your money's going. Um, if you're like me, I used to be terrible. I have no idea where my money's going. Get to the end of the month, and I think to myself, well, where on earth is all my money? And um, praise God. So those, so those ones there, YNAB and Emma, very helpful on those two books, I would recommend. Okay, let's stop that sharing. Let's get back onto this teaching right here. And um, so this is the third session. And I want to spend the third session speaking about debt. I want to spend the third session speaking about debt. And so we've got a few people coming in. You are welcome. Praise God. So we're speaking about debt. Uh, you know, debt is a huge thing. Debt is a huge thing. You know, I said it last week. One of the number one causes of divorce in this country is financial problems. Financial problems. Um, you know, and, and, and debt is, is definitely one of them. Debt is definitely one of them. Debt is often crushing for people. It's, um, it's not a nice place to be in, to be in debt. And we live in a culture that promotes debt. We live in a culture that um, glamorizes debt and um, which actively encourages you to partake in debt. And, you know, debt is not good. Now, is debt a sin? Is debt a sin according to the Bible? Absolutely not. It is not a sin. It is not a sin at all. And I will say this, is that debt, you know, that there are some debts I would say in the UK that you're living in that are unavoidable. So when I'm speaking against debt here, I don't want you to think, oh man, you know, if you have a mortgage, um, you know, it, it's almost unavoidable in the UK. You know, especially if you live in London. Um, I don't know many people, I know some people, I don't know many people who have bought their first house in cash. I don't. They just, you know, in London, you know, you, what are you pay three hundred thousand pounds. They just turn up three hundred thousand pounds, lay it down in cold hard cash, and say, "I'm buying this house." That's not really how it how it happens. Um, you know, you have to get a mortgage, and so it's a debt that's kind of unavoidable. But it's not a debt I'm totally against because, as we can see, house prices just rise and rise and rise all the time. And if you're dedicated and disciplined to paying your payments you end up making money at the end of it. And um, but here's, here's, here's a fun fact though, um, the word mortgage, the word mortgage um, is, is two words, old English words, malt and gauge. Malt, think of the word mortuary. Um, it's the word death and gauge means grip. Yeah, so the, word, the old English word actually means death, grip. So as much as I say a mortgage is, um, is an unavoidable debt if you want to own a house, um, the root of the word is actually death grip, which isn't that great, <laughs> praise God. But um, it's, it's something that I'm not against. Um, but, you know, but is debt a sin? No, it's not. But sin may be the cause of your debt. And is debt something that God wants you to live in and be in? No. Um, let me read a scripture here, Deuteronomy 15, 6. Deuteronomy 15, 6. And this is where I get the idea that debt is not a sin. It says, for the Lord your God will bless you, just as he has promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. So he says here that God's going to bless you as he's promised you, that you shall lend to many nations, and you shall not borrow. So you shall lend, but you shall not borrow which gives the implication that those nations are borrowing from you. If I lend something to you, it means I want it back. But if, if I say, look, okay, look, I'm going to lend this to you, that means I want it back. If I say, hey, I'm giving this to you, that means you can keep it. <clears throat> so God is encouraging the children of Israel here to lend to nations to get something back. But then he says, but well, you shall not borrow from nations. You shall lend. So if borrowing was a sin, if being in debt to somebody or something or an organization was a sin, then God here would be actively encouraging you to encourage someone else to sin by putting them into debt, by putting them under debt. And but he's not into that. But, debt, but he's saying the best way to live 
is to not be always borrowing. The best way to live is to be the person who's lending. I mean, because you're going to get the interest off of that and other things. I, yeah, I think the Bible speaks more clearly about not extortion, not, not having extortion at interest rates, you know, putting interest on people when you lend to them, that they have to pay back a huge amount. That's not in the heart of God. But I don't believe God, God is against you lending and having interest come back. And, um, but it's definitely not a sin to be in debt. It's not a sin. Now, sin may be the cause that you're in debt. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that. And I've been there, all right? It's, this is not me who's like saying, you know, I'm perfect. No, no, no. But it's not a sin to be in debt. But it's not God's best. It's not God's best. And I really want to just hammer in today that um, let's seek to not be in debt. Again, and, and, and the only thing I would, I would say is excluded from that in the UK is owning a house because that, that, that's just something that's unavoidable. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a debt that will um, most probably make you money, most likely um, make you money. And, um, but you know, it says that you shall not borrow, but you shall lend to many nations. You shall reign over many nations. Now, when you're lending, you're in a position of power. When you're borrowing, you're in a position of weakness. You're in somebody's pocket when you're borrowing. They own a part of you. They, can, they make demands of you. You're almost restricted when you are borrowing from somebody. There's a restriction there. In Proverbs 22, 7, it says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave of the lender. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of of the lender. Wow. The borrower is the slave of the lender. I tell you, when I read that, I was like, man, that's strong. That's strong. Some translations say servant. Here it says the borrower is the slave of the lender. You know, a slave, and you know, slave, you know, your life is not your own. You are under somebody else. They tell you where to go. They tell you what to do. They restrict your life. You cannot go where you want to go. You cannot do what you want to do. You are under the control of somebody else when you're a slave. It's a, it's a horrible place to be. And it says here that the borrower is the slave to the lender. This is why we do not want to be in debt. This is why we have to have a mentality in this world that is just throwing debt at you from all kinds of places, from everywhere, saying, you know, you, you, if you want this, then get in debt for this and you can have it now. But once you do that, you become a slave, you become restricted. And I said this last week, you know, when I was talking about budgeting and different things, you know, too often we are taking short-term pleasures, but we're restricting our long-term goals. Basically, we, are, we can't do the things we really want because we spend too much, too much time spending money on things that we don't really want, but we want them now. And, you know, we're not patient as people. And because of that, we become slaves to lenders. And, you know, there, there are some horrific ones out there at the moment. Um, there are some horrific debts that are being offered to people. The government have tried to shut down some of these companies, you know, these payday loans uh, companies. They are horrific. They are absolutely terrible. And they, those ones especially, you know, they will make you a slave. They will make you a slave. You, you will not, you know, you'll be in your heart. I said this last week, you know, about Barry Bennett when he went to be a missionary. And he went to the, um, the selection process. And they asked everybody in the room, who's in debt here? People put their hand up and they said, okay, we can't select you. You need to come back next year when you're not in debt. They have become a slave to money. They have become a slave to the lender. That lender's now restricted them from doing what God has called them to do. This is, the, you know, this is why it's so important that we say, I don't want to be under debt because I cannot do what I want to do. Maybe it's in your heart to go on, you know, to visit, you know, a certain country. Could be a missionary. It could just be a holiday you want. You know, for me, it's not a missionary, but I'd love to go to Israel. If I'm up to my eyeballs in debt, I'm restricted to do what I want to do. And uh, you know, and, and too often we're restricted to do what we want to do because we are in debt and we are a slave to that lender. And you know what? I just wanted to think about that. Think about that that idea of being a being a slave to that lender. You know, it's, it, it's not a great place to be. It's a, it's a horrible place to be. 
every time you, you, you go into a situation where there's an opportunity to go into debt, and maybe usually you would just click into that and go into that. Think to yourself, do I want to be a slave to this? Do I want to be a slave to this? And you know, there, there are so many different things out there now. You know, like, um, you know, I'm from the generation of PayPal. PayPal came out when I was a teenager. I love PayPal. You know, PayPal is the online um, system where you can, I mean, you can give to our church online through PayPal. But PayPal offer debt now. PayPal offer credit. They even offer 0% credit on stuff and you can pay. And, you know, when you see 0%, you go, oh man, it's free. Without realizing these companies make money somehow, some way. And never fall for that stuff. When you go into it, you're a slave unto them. Every month you have to pay them back. And, and then you can't do exactly what you want to do during that month. So keep that in your mind. Do not let debt dictate your life. Stay away from it. So I put here in 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22, right? It's one of my favorite scriptures because it's so easy to remember. You cannot forget this. 2 Timothy 2.22. Okay, that's all the twos. It says, so flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I've always taught from this scripture, and I love this scripture, I've always taught from this, from an idea of sexual purity, of fleeing from youthful passions. You know, don't, don't fall into like sexual lust as a, as a young person does. But as I've been reading this, I've been thinking, hang on a sec. It's a bit narrow-minded just to think that the only passion that young people have is just of, of a sexual nature or, or just of a, you know, of a lust nature. And, 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 you know, it's still a good teaching. You can look at Joseph in his life in the Old Testament when Potiphar's wife tried to try it on with him. He ran away. He ran from her. He didn't try to debate her. He didn't try to, you know, push her back and say, look, let me teach you why this is wrong. There are some things in your life you just need to run from. You need to say, man, you are... If I stay here, sin is right here, and I need to run from this right now. I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to run from it. But, you know, there are many youth, youthful passions. We've all been young people. Praise God. We, we've all done stupid things. And um, uh, I met a family member um, I hadn't seen for years uh, uh, last month. And they said to me, man, you know what? When I was younger, I looked back and I think, man, I did so many stupid things. I said, well, didn't we all? <laughs> Didn't we all have that in our in 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 youthful times? We all did, to a certain degrees, things that were just of stupidity. But one of the youthful passions is, is that you do not want to wait for anything. You do not want to wait for anything. You know, it, it's being very impulsive. Being very, very impulsive is that, you know, when, when you go for a car journey and you have a young, a young person in the car, what comes out of there? their mouth when it's a long journey. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Man, I can't wait anymore. I want to be there now. I don't want to wait. You're like, come on, this is like a four hour journey, you know? And uh, are we there yet? It's a youthful lust. They want things. It's a youthful passion. They want things right now. They want that impulse of saying, I don't want to wait for this. I want it right now. That's, a, that's such a childlike mentality, isn't it? You know, but it, when you, when you say you're going to do something, they're like, okay, you must do it now. It's like, no, I can't do it now. You're going to have to wait. And, but they are too immature to wait. They must have this thing now. And that's, that's how debt really sits, um, just comes into our life, comes through the back door into our life. It's often through immaturity of being impatient. And again, I put my hand up, been there, done that, done that thing. And, you know, it's like when you go to school as a kid and, you know, and one of your friends or a group of your friends, they got the new trainers. And you go home to your mum and you say, mum, I want these trainers. You say, well, why do you want these trainers? They're like, they're like so expensive. You go, oh, yeah, but all my friends have got them. Man, I, I have to have this. Otherwise, all my friends have got these and I don't have these. And that's the worst thing in the world. I must have this. I need this new backpack. Everyone's got this backpack. Ah, I need a phone. Mum, I need a phone because everyone's got a phone. My, my friend's got a phone. I have to have a phone. It has to be an Apple phone because everyone's got an Apple phone. And we've all heard it. We've all said it. <laughs> the, you know, we've all been there. And you think, yeah, you know, I'll be, but you, you know, I need this toy. I need a Game Boy. I need an Xbox, whatever it is. You know, I need, I need these, you know, whatever they are. Praise God. It changes every year because my friend's got it. 
And you think, yeah, you know what, but we grow out of that. No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. Because what happens when you grow up? You go around someone's house and you see something in their house. You go, man, that's a nice TV. That's a, what? That's a four ultra HD, 100 inch, gazillion inch, whatever TV that I can talk to it and it talks back to me. And you go home and it's in your mind. You're thinking, oh, I need to have that TV. I need to have that TV. I need to have that TV. My friend's got that TV. I need to have it. Or you go around their house and you see they've got a car. And you, and, you know, and, and they drive you somewhere and their car's got Bluetooth. It's got the, you know, the, the air con. They, don't, they just sets the temperature you want it to be. It's got heated seats. You go, I have a side heated. You go, I need to have that car. You know, the Joneses over the road have got that car. I need to have that car. And all of a sudden you realize, I don't have the money for it. But the impulse is there. The seed has been sown. I don't have the money for that TV. Or maybe I do, I just don't want to spend it. And I, I, I look up the TV, maybe I look it up on the internet. Maybe I go to a shop and just, you know, window shop. And it's like a thousand pounds for this TV. If you, I don't want to, I haven't got the money to spend a thousand pounds on the TV. But then they have this little tag on them now. They have a little tag on them. And they say something like, pay zero today. Pay nothing for 12 months and then just pay 25 pounds a month. And you think, my days, you know what? I can't afford a thousand pounds, but I can afford 25 pounds a month. I can afford 25 pounds a month. You know what? I'm going to do it. And this is how they get you. This is how they always get you. And again, I say this, I've, I've, I've been done like this. All right. You sign up because you, because you say, I can afford to pay the monthly payment. That's stupidity. All right. I've been stupid myself. That's stupidity. Again, you need some of that old, you know, like my grandparents would say to me, my parents would say to me, that if you don't have the money for it, you don't have the money for it. You're going to have to wait. All right. And I guess, again, the only thing I exclude from that is a house. Because no one's walking up with a house first time with 300 grand in cash. Okay, that's the only, a mortgage is different. But everything else is consumer debt. And if you don't have the money for it, you don't have the money for it, all right? Because I'll tell you, if you sign up for £25 a month, you're paying over that, that TV that's £1,000, you're probably paying £1,300 by the end of it. You're paying for that for five years or three years. Chances are within four years, the TV will break. And then you spend the last year paying off, paying off that TV that you don't even have anymore. Man, I've heard of people, I've heard of people who, you know what? <laughs> They're paying off things that are broken. Other people who are paying off of marriages that have already broken up. They got in debt to get married. I said about this last week. Don't get in debt to get married. That's, that's crazy. And then it, it splits. And then you carry on paying it afterwards. I mean, that, 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 that must be so... It's all about rub salt into the wound. Listen, if you don't have the money for it, you don't have the money for it. You just have to be honest. You say, well, I know my friend's got that TV. And, and here's the thing. A lot of the time, your friend who's got the TV, they probably didn't have the money for it either. They're probably in debt. Don't go and follow them. Don't follow the, you know, don't let the blind follow the blind, all right? Come out of this keeping up with the mentality of keeping up with the Joneses, all right? Because God is asking you to be a good steward. And when you have that impulse, and we all have impulses, we all have things we think, oh, man, you know, I really want that now. We all have things that, we, that can get us sidetracked and to... You know, pull us into debt. Stay away from those things. Stay away from those things. You know, because you want to be a good steward of, of the money that God has given you. You know, credit cards is another thing. Credit cards. I didn't have a credit card for years until I was about, I don't know, about my late 20s, I think. I, I got a credit card. Um, and some people, you know, I, sometimes you have to have one. I had to have one because when I go and rent a car, you have to put a credit card over or the, uh, like the, the deposit, and if you crash it, they take the money out of the credit card, that kind of thing. Um, so I realized I had to have one. I didn't like it. And then I started to use it for, for different things, like paying my car insurance. Instead of paying it monthly, I paid it all off at once with a credit card, and then paid it monthly through that. But you know what? There's a temptation to, to catch you out. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I've been caught out with that, because then when you have that thing in your pocket, you think, man, I can buy more things than, than I'd usually be able to. Uh, again, it goes back to that mentality. If you don't have the money for it, don't have the money for it. 
if you're not disciplined with credit cards, then don't get credit cards. I'm telling you, there's nothing good about credit cards, you know, honestly. Apart from car rentals, people talk about credit scores. Man, I tell you what, don't get in debt over anything. There are people about it. Here's another thing. Talking from a church perspective, we'll talk about this later in giving. And if you're giving to church via credit card, we don't want your money. We do not want your money via credit card. Okay, because we want, here's what we want. We want your money as a church. We want you to give from your heart, your money from your wallet, or your purse into the church. We do not want the money from someone you're borrowing from. That's not your money. That's somebody else's money. And that's putting you into debt. And that's not healthy for you. And that's not healthy for the church as a whole. We do not want you to be putting yourself into debt, trying to finance the church, okay? We want you to prosper. We want you to increase. And, you know, we do not want you to be in debt. Man, you know, I, I remember when I was at Bible college, there was a lady speaking. She used to be the director of um, the college in America, her and her husband. And they had a guy who was just way, way, way behind on his monthly payments for his college fees. He was months behind. He owed the college quite a lot of money. And then one day they had like a, a lunch with the students. And this guy was like, guys, I'm going to buy everyone a pizza. So he bought pizzas for everyone. He fed the whole college. It wasn't so big back then. You're talking like 20 years ago now. He fed everyone with pizza. He bought pizza for everyone. And somebody came up to the, the director and said, how, how generous is that guy? He bought everyone pizza with his own money. And she went, that guy's not generous. She went, that's not his money. That's my money. He owes me thousands. <laughs> he just used my money to pay pizza. Man, this is, what, this is why we don't want you to be giving to put yourselves into debt, all right? We want you to give of your own money, not debt money, okay? Because debt money just puts you deeper and deeper into our hole, and you're giving money from somebody else, which is not from you. It's not healthy. It's not a healthy way to live. Praise God. Let me read this here. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. But he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Thankfulness is one of the key ways of staying out of debt. I'm telling you, thankfulness stops impulsiveness. Being content is what stops impulsiveness. You see something on the TV. You see something on, you know, Facebook. Uh, I, I read a comment the other day. It made me laugh. You know, Facebook listens to you on your phone. Then it, it brings adverts up while you're looking. I mean, there are things I've never entered on my phone, but I spoke with somebody about it. And I go on my phone and the adverts are all for that thing. My phone is listening and it's kind of scary. Somebody read, the way I do online shopping is now, I just shout out loud everything I want. And then I go and scroll from my, my, my Facebook ads and they put everything I need on there for me, uh, which is kind of scary. But I encourage you, man, be thankful for what you have, even if it's not where you want to be. Even if it's not, you know, I'm in places where I don't, you know, it's not, my end goal. It's not where my heart's desire to be. I am thankful for where I am. I'm thankful for what I have. I'm telling you, when you start speaking out vocally, you get in your car and you know your friend's got a car that's nicer than yours and you sit in that car and you're not jealous, you're not envious, you just would like a car like that. But you just say, Lord, I'm thankful for the car I have. I thank Lord, I thank you that it starts and it runs and it goes. And you start expressing thankfulness. And as you start to do that, you know what? Discontent starts to leave your life. But when you sit there going, man, it's a stupid car. It never starts. You know what? The, I, I, I've still got the old style radio. I, I wish I could connect my phone to the car. You know, I, I wish it had sensors on the back of it. I wish this, I wish that. You're, you're creating discontent. And then with discontent, you make the wrong decisions. You, you make impulsive decisions through discontent. Adverts are trying to persuade you that everything you have is wrong and you need what they have. It's like fairy liquid, isn't it? Every year it's like the new, improved, best ever fairy. I'm like, what was wrong with last year's fairy? You know, was the fairy 10 years ago that bad? And, uh, but they're trying to convince you, man, you need to come back. You need to keep buying this and buying this and buying this. And it's discontent. It's one of the, the roots of why we get into debt. It's because you think, man, I need this now. I'm not happy right now, but if you get to a place where you are content and you are happy, I'm telling you, you're hard to budge. You're hard to budge. You won't make stupid decisions. You won't jump into things. 
just because you are, you do not make decisions out of being discontent in your flesh. Now, being discontent in your spirit is a different thing altogether, where God is moving you on to another place, where God is doing something in your life, and, or you see something that's wrong that's happening in the world, and you're discontent about it, that's different. But we know that there's a fleshly discontent. There's a fleshly discontent. It can even go all the way down to, man, I'm not happy with my spouse. You know what? They've done this, they've done that, they've done that. No, you need to be thankful. You need to say, Lord, I just thank you for this. Lord, I thank you for this. I thank you for the, the man or the woman you put in my life. I thank you for my children. I thank you for my parents. I thank you for whoever it is, my brothers and sisters. I thank you for these people. You be thankful for them. And then that being content stops you making ridiculous decisions. You know, praise God. You know, I've got a Skoda car. And they rung me up, the dealer, and they're like, pulled me up and I said, oh, you've had your Skoda. Are you happy with it? I'm like, yeah, I'm happy with, with my Skoda. It's a great car. And it's diesel. It's great. It, it, it runs every time. It's blue, which is my favorite color. Yeah. And, um, but they, they rung me up. I said, man, we've got a Skoda show just for your style of car, the one you've got. And, um, you know, when, when, when are you looking to trade your car in? I said, what? He said, when you're looking to trade it in, like, how long do you want to have your car? I said, I want, I want it till it breaks. <laughs> I want it till it breaks. It's not that the car's not new, but it's not old either. I said, but I said, I want this car at least 10 years. And um, more, more than that. And this guy went, okay, um, bye. <laughs> he just put the phone down on me. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I'm content with the car. They, they come and say, well, do you want the newer model? It has this, it has that. I'm like, man, this car runs brilliantly. All right, all, all I need my car to do is to get me wherever I need to go. And if it's cold, keep me warm. And if it's hot, at least open the window, okay? <laughs> at least open the window, praise God. And um, I see someone here can, cannot hear. I'm presuming everyone else can hear because no one else has said, so maybe you're yeah, coming in and out or connect, make sure you connect to the audio on the Zoom. Um, when it says connect to audio, connect to that, that will make it work. But being, this, being content will stop you. Man, if I was discontent with my car, you know, there are things with my car that are not quite right. Um, and, and if I focused only on those things, if I focused only on those things that were just wrong, and then suddenly rings me up and says, man, do you want to change your car for a better model or a bigger model? I'm like, yeah, go on then, because I'm fed up with these things. But when you focus, you say, you know what, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful that this works and that works and this works. Even if your car, car is junk, man, I've had junk cars. And some of you have seen my cars, all right? Some people have laughed at my cars. But you know what? I try to be as thankful as possible. Just thank God for that car because I know it will stop me from making stupid decisions and it'll stop me from doing things that are wrong. And so, yeah, so this helps you stay away from debt when they come out and they try to put you into more and more debt. You say, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. And, um, man, so let's just um, move into something else then. Getting out of debt. What if you are in debt? What if you are in debt? Um, you know, and you, now you think, oh, my days, I'm a slave. This guy just told me I'm a slave. Now I'm a slave. Um, don't despair. Okay. I've been there. I have debt. I'm not going to lie to you. I have debt. I have, I have my own things I need to deal with. And um, don't despair. God is on your side. All right. God is on your side. And and uh, last week I said this, there's a, te the, the, there's a phrase that gets thrown about, God helps those who help themselves. People say, oh, no, that's wrong. God helps those who can't help themselves. Uh, I'm telling you, with debt, I'm going to be honest, with debt, God helps those who help themselves in this area. God will help you if you're willing to help yourself. That's not God saying, hey, I'm not willing to help you. That's God. He wants to help you as much as you can. But we have to be willing to work with him. We have to be willing to step out in faith in what he's sharing, telling us to do. And you know, in in in, in James, I remember the scriptures come, but it says, "Faith without works is dead." Faith without works is dead. Um, faith without works is dead. If your faith has no work with it, it is dead faith. If your faith has no legs, that it's running, <laughs> that it's doing anything, it's dead faith. Just like the body without the spirit is dead and it's lifeless and it cannot move and it cannot go anywhere. 
when your faith has no action to it your faith is dead it's not faith it's just hope it's just hope without action your faith needs action to it and you need to have action to your faith and this here's the thing the uk as a whole the average amount of debt per, per household is over ten thousand um, pounds that's just a fact you can look, you can look that up actually it might even be I'm coming down to per, per adult person it's huge it's a massive issue in this country many christians want to be out of debt many christians want to be out of debt if you ask them lord i'm believing to be out of debt absolutely absolutely the question is what are you going to do about it what are you going to do about it and i refer you back to last week luke 14 i shared when jesus people said that, you know they wanted to, to be a disciple of jesus and jesus turned around and said you need to count the cost you know luke 14 26 onwards he says you know you must love me more than you love your father your mother your wife your sister your brother even your own life you must love me or you you, know, you must hate them compared to the love you have for me jesus said that and then he said you know what kind of king when he goes out to battle doesn't assess the army that he has and the numbers that he has compared to the army that he's fighting why doesn't he or what kind of person tries to build a tower and they don't assess the materials they have and the money they have and the, maybe the labor they have to get that tower built lest halfway through it they run out of money they run out of materials and everyone laughs at them and mocks them he's saying count the cost when you want to do something you have to count you have to assess Here's the thing you have to assess beforehand what materials do i have or if you're going to war how many men do i have to go out to battle how many horses do i have what's my artillery what's my you know whatever it is they would use back then spears bows and arrows swords what kind of weaponry do we have that have to get the numbers and i would say this i said this last week you have to break down your life into numbers when it comes down to finances ignorance is not bliss all right ignorance is killing you ignorance is is, is is ruining you financially you have to be honest and say let me write down everything that's that's in my life all my my income and every penny that i'm spending i know that's not fun i don't like doing that but i know then once you get the numbers you can start to see the facts of the situation you know and you say well lord i want to get out of debt and once you have the numbers you realize okay this is the amount i have coming in from my work and from other different types of income so here's my expenditures and you and then you might see when you break down the numbers again last week i told you be very specific buy that yellow book i did at the beginning of this the yellow book by vicky rob robson i think will help you will really help you do that because then the numbers will tell a story okay the numbers tell a story of what you're doing with your money i hate i used to hate maths okay I used to hate maths at school. I barely passed my GCSE. I couldn't believe I got a C. I celebrated. And, but now I learned that numbers tell a story. I like maths a lot more because they can help you. And sometimes the story it tells you is not a good one. Sometimes it tells you that you're very wasteful with money. Sometimes it tells you that straight up, they just don't have much money coming in to, to cover the expenses in your life. But then it gives you, then you know where you are. It gives you a picture that you know where you are. So then you know what to believe God for. You can say, look, Lord, I really don't have the money for this. I mean, like, honestly, Lord, like, I, I could cut back all the pleasures that I do in my life. You know, all the Netflixes, all the going out to eat, all, you know, spending money on clothes that I don't particularly need. I could cut all that out. And I still don't have enough money to get out of debt. I still don't have enough money to do this. But at least you know where you are. You can say, Lord, this is what I need to do. Too often we don't, we have no idea of where we are. <laughs> we have no idea. We're believing God for things we don't actually know what we're believing for. But once you realize, man, and, and then you realize this is what I can do. This is what I can do to start getting out of debt. And you know, um, a lot, you know, a lot of this inspiration I take from from Dave Ramsey. If you know him, um, he's on. He's got a great Facebook um, page. You can see he does a radio show in America. Um, some of it's very American. Some of it's very American. He's Maybe the closest person you'll get to the UK to this guy is uh, Martin Lewis, but I don't believe Martin Lewis is a Christian. Dave Ramsey comes from a strong Christian perspective, teaches from the Bible. And, um, but they, they help people get out of debt. I encourage you to join in with them. And they have something called a debt snowboard. You've heard of it. Very, very helpful. Um, it's basically, you, you write all your debts down. 
every single one of your debts. Again, which is maybe painful. How much you pay a month, how much you have left in the account to pay off, everything. Again, I exclude the mortgage because it's going to be massive. And we're talking about consumer debt here. Then all you do is you put everything on your debt to minimum payment, which maybe a lot of people are doing anyway. Put everything on your debt to minimum payment, apart from the smallest debt you have to pay. So maybe you've got one for £500, you've got a credit card. You've got other things, you've got a car off, you've got a sofa, whatever. Leave those. You break these down to £500 credit card. You take all the money and you pile it against that small debt. You kill that debt. You go after that debt with everything you have. Then you, you get rid of it. And then you think, wow, I paid that debt off now. I don't have to spend £200 a month. Maybe I can go and spend that on clothes. Maybe I can go and spend that on technology. No, no, no. So you take that money that was left over and you put it into the next debt, the next smallest one, and you get rid of that. Even if the interest on these aren't that bad compared to the higher ones, just kill off the smaller ones. It will snowball. It will literally snowball. What it will do, it will encourage you. When you pay off something and it's done, it's finished, it's an encouragement. You look at that credit card, you think, man, you are no more. Take pleasure. Cut the, uh, cut the thing up. Have a party, praise God. Enjoy it. It will encourage you to go and do the next one and the next one. Start with the small ones and attack them. But here's the thing. You have to be committed to it. And you have to be willing to make a sacrifice sometimes. Now, here's the thing. If you're not willing to make a sacrifice, you're not committed to something. That's just a fact. So there's a lot of people out there saying, well, Lord, set me free from debt. Get me out of debt. And it's like, well, are you willing to make the sacrifice? Well, no, I'm not willing. Well, then, you know, you're not going to get out of debt. Because even if God does set you free from that, I guarantee you'll find yourself back in it. Something has to change on the inside, in your heart, and in your mind, in your actions, in your attitudes towards money, and um, take sacrifice. And again, I, I, I put my hand up to be somebody like this. You know, you, you learn to be more disciplined. But then you get rid of one, you get rid of the next, you get rid of the next. And, then you, and what will happen is, as you're doing that, as you're making your own practical natural input into this god will supernaturally come beside you and he will he will eliminate things for you i guarantee it and if you've been in debt a long time and all you've been doing is asking god to set you free and it hasn't worked maybe it's time to change maybe it's time to say look let me take some responsibility for this and then allow god to come alongside me and to empower me again like last week deuteronomy 8 18 it is god who gives you power to get wealth he gives you the ability to get wealth. Too often we're saying, Lord, just give me wealth. No, no, he said, I give you the ability to get wealth. I'm telling you, he gives you the ability to get out of debt. Needs, I think someone needs to say that to themselves now, because maybe you're in so much debt and you've been in it so long that it's just almost impossible, the, the idea of you getting out of debt. You need to say, God gives me the power to get out of debt. God gives me the ability to get out of debt. I'm telling you, you say that, ideas come to you, thoughts come to you, that will help you. People come into your life who will give you wisdom, who will lift you up to another level. And sometimes we, we, we need to break free of the mindsets that we have on the inside of us. I'm telling you, God has been setting me free from terrible financial mindsets over the years. You know, for, for many years, I thought X amount of money was a good wage, was a good income. And, um, and so because of that, I never really went beyond that wage bracket. Because in my mind, I was like, man, this is a great income. This is really good. If I ever get there, I'll be so happy. And then God just spoke to me one day. He said, man, you are restricting yourself by saying that this is a great income. He says, let me set the target for you in your life. Let me set the boundaries for you. Don't, set the, don't restrict yourself. Don't restrict what God can do in your life. So if you're sitting there saying, this debt's so big, I'll never pay it off. Stop saying that. Say, God gives me the ability to um, get out of debt. God gives me the ability to obtain wealth that will get me out of debt. However you want to say that, speak it out. Speak it out. But yeah, praise God. So definitely attack that debt with everything you have. Attack it with everything you have. And I'm telling you, it will go. It will go. I just want to give you some tips. Again, this is very practical. Praise God. Just some tips. You know, some things I see with people, some people are very good at this. Some people are terrible at this, all right? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, this happened with my dad. Bless my dad. 
And um, he, he's been with the AA breakdown service, yeah, for years. And anyway, something happened with his car. There was an error and the payment didn't go through. He was paying like 50, I don't know how much he was paying, 50, 60 pound a month for breakdown. So anyway, AA kicked him off. So he had to sign up again. But when he signed up again, it turns out it was 15 pound a month now, what he gets. So for years, he just let it renew, renew and renew and renew. And now he's paying like, I mean, what is that? It's like 35 pound, 45 pound over the top every month for his breakdown cover because he never checked. And we just don't think about doing that. So one of the things I would, I would encourage you to do, this is just about saving money, okay? Check your bills, check the things you pay out, your, let's say, breakdown cover and car, check your bills, especially utility bills, check them regularly. Make sure, make sure that you're getting a good deal on them you can save money praise god you can save money listen to people who who talk about these things that they will help you out um when you know when, when you do your car insurance don't just let it renew take some time do some comparison websites look them up you know a good time of the year a good time of the month to do this is the end of the month because the people on the phones are trying to get as many many new customers as possible so then you've got a bit of haggling on the phone with them Often on the phone is so much better than doing things online. If you can get a number and call them and say, look, what can you give me for this? Um, you've got more chance of saving money, getting a better deal for something. So if you call at the end of the month, but people are trying to get as many, you know, so they get their commission up, just to put through as many, many deals as possible, try it, praise God. Um, I said this last week, things like takeouts, takeaway, man, if you're up to your eyeballs in debt, you know, try to stay away from these things. I'm not saying never have them, but if you're eating out all the time, it's probably why, one of the reasons that, that we're in debt. When you're buying vehicles, cars, how economical are they? Look them up. Don't just say, oh, it's a nice color. It's the model I like, it looks so nice. I mean, what's it like to drive? Do some research on the internet. Find some reviews from people. Do these cars break down a lot? Do they have a, a, a problem with them? How, how expensive are the parts? You know, are they cheap? Are they expensive? Are they easy to get hold of? You know, find out about these things. It'll save you money. I want, I want to give you two websites, okay? Two websites that just help you out, all right? Especially at Christmas time, okay? If there is something specific that you want to buy at Christmas, there's a website I use. I use it a lot for electrical things. I've used it for cars. Um, it, it, it's just a website, and I'll show you what it is here. Where am I? Here. Share with you. Uh, it's not this ammo one. I'll wait for this thing to go away. Here, here we go. This one here is called hotukdeals.com. Hotukdeals.com. Um, this website has literally everything on it. Now, if you have something in mind that you want to buy, it's great for things like mobile phones. You can go up here in the search, you can type it out. You got Lego, laptops, TV. If I click on here an iPhone, it will bring up. The website here and then they have deals and people post whether they think something is cheap or expensive and people vote for it whether it's cold or whether it's hot if it's cold it's a bad deal and if you go down if it's hot like that it's a good deal it means people think it's a good price and uh, for whatever reason now here's the thing this website's great because you can click on this one you're finding out something is cheap and, and it's at a good deal but the other thing is when you go down, you have comments from people, like a forum, and people will, will give their opinion. I can come off this now. People will give their opinion on that product. And maybe you're buying a phone, you think, well, you know, I'm gonna get that phone. One, you realize, oh, that's a good price because everyone's voting it to be a good price. But the other thing is people will say, you know what, I've got this phone, but you know what, the battery life's really rubbish on it. And then, and then another two or three people will say, you know what, I've had the same experience, the battery life on the phone is really bad. Like, man, everything else on the phone is great, the screen looks good, the camera's amazing, but the battery life is very, very poor. Then you can realize, well, actually, that's not what I want then. And it's really good, because then you can get feedback from people who actually own the products. And because you know Amazon right now are having issues with fake reviews on their website, and people, are, companies are piling on fake reviews on their own products, you think, oh, that's a really good product. It's got a thousand good reviews. You buy it and you think, man, this is junk. 
how on earth did it get its fake reviews? That website's very good. Um, and it's got everything on there from food. What I would say is don't spend too long on there because you're going to end up buying things you never intended to buy just because they're cheap. But if you have something specific in mind, like a washing machine, you know, I've been looking up this week for a washer dryer and um, I'm finding out about that. And people give their comments and their wisdom on it. I'm telling you, it saved me money. It saved me buying something that I don't have to go and rebuy again. And someone says, oh, I bought this washing machine, but it broke because this part always breaks. And then a few other people confirm that and they say, yeah, you know what? I've done that as well. I've done that as well. So if you, you know, it will help you, especially at Christmas, if you've got kids and you want to buy certain things for them, you can keep an eye on that website for good, good prices as well. Um, there's one other website I want to recommend. And again, these may be of no interest to you or some interest. If you use Amazon a lot, and at the moment, the way things are going with, I'm talking now, this is the 24th of October, 2020. Um, we're in, I'm in England right now. I know Wales has just shut down. And they're shutting down all non-essential items to buy. So supermarkets, you can't even go in there and buy a toaster at the moment, which is crazy because it just gives all the power to the online stores. Amazon is going to go crazy at the moment. Um, their value is going to go up no end. So if you're going to be using Amazon, I have this website. Um, it's been around for a few years. And let me show you this website. Just say that there's an item that you want to buy. Maybe you've got a child and maybe they want the new PlayStation. And maybe you're saying, you know what, it's coming out this year in November, but it's 500 pounds. That's ridiculous. I'm not spending that. We don't have the money for that. So I'll buy you it next year. What you can do is you can go on this website here. Let me show you it. Uh, where am I? What have I done with that? Did I close it? Let me find this website. It's disappeared on me. It needs to come back. Um, let me just close a few things. The website's called Camel Camel Camel, which is a very, very strange name, I know. Um, it's called Camel Camel Camel. And when I say Camel Camel Camel, I want, I want you to think of humps. The camel has humps, right? And the humps go like this. And um, this is what this website does. It's, uh, there we go. What you do, you can sign up to it. Right, free, it's all free. You can look for a product. You can type your product in here, and you know you can type in something like I don't know an iPhone 10. I don't really know much about iPhone, so will that even come up with anything? It'll find you a product like an iPhone X 64. Um, it'll tell whether it's in stock or not. But you can click on it. And here's the thing that it does. It's really really great. You can go down. You have this graph and it shows you how much this thing has been selling for over the years. So in October, 2017, it was 700 pound. And then it goes, and now it's worth 380 pound. Now, how, how does this help you? When you're buying some on Amazon, it's on sale. You can actually go and check to see if that's the, pr the best price recently that it's been or whether it's ever been cheaper than that. And the powerful thing about this is you can put your email address in and say, look, Maybe this iPhone is 600 pounds at the moment, and I only want to pay 400 pounds or 500 pounds. You can write the amount you want to spend, put your email in, and they will email you. As soon as Amazon ever dropped that price down to 500 pounds, you'll get an email saying the price has just dropped. You can go and buy that now. So you don't have to continually check. It's a great way over the year if you want to buy a present for somebody and you want it at a certain price, you don't need it right now. You can save money doing that, praise God. And um, so, so those two websites, and for, for wisdom on items, just practical stuff, you know, it's very, very helpful. Um, praise God. I know that's not for everyone. That's just a little side thing that I, I, I thought would help. And um, praise God. But let's, um, I'm going to go in some totally different direction now. God wants you out of debt, for sure. I'm going to talk about tithing. I'm going to talk about tithing right now. So... Taking a totally different direction and still with money, still with finances. Um, do I say this now? I do say this now. As we're on debt, um, transitioning, um, if you're in debt, this is a good question, by the way. If you're in debt, should you tithe? Should you tithe? Um, personally, I would. Personally, I would. I believe it's a good. 
and I'm going to talk about tithing, why I believe tithing is good. I believe if you're in debt, I still believe it's wise to tithe. I still believe it's good to take your income and take a portion and give it to the Lord. I still believe that. Um, as for offerings, and offerings I'm going to talk about next week, that's something different. But I will say this about offerings. If I'm heavily in debt, I reduce my offerings. Not my tithing. My tithing is, for me, is a non-negotiable. All right? This is me personally. But my offerings is something different. And if me offering and giving donations to ministries, donations to, I don't know, certain conferences or whatever, and that's not helping me get out of debt, and I'm doing so many offerings that I am still stuck in debt and I'm struggling, that's not God's heart for you, okay? If you are honest enough and disciplined enough to say, look, that money I'd usually give on a direct debit to such and such a place, I'm going to take that out because I've got so much debt, consumer debt, I'm not talking about mortgages, and I'm going to take that money just to get myself out of debt because if you're willing to, to, for a short period of time, to cut back and to get yourself out of debt, you'll be in a stronger position to give bigger offerings later on down the line. Not to, I'm not talking about tithing. Tithing for me should, should always be done. But offerings, man, if you're in debt, try to get out of debt as much as you possibly can. I'm telling you, our heart as a church, we, we, we want you to be healthy. We want you to be financially healthy and not, not up to your eyeballs in debt, not being able to sleep at night, struggling, but it's still giving offerings all the time. It's not healthy for you to be in. Here's the caveat of that, though. You are always, always, always open to the Holy Spirit. Do not close yourself to the Holy Spirit on this. So the times where I said, okay, look, I'm cutting back my offerings. I pray to God about it. I feel like God says, yes, cut this back, but keep these two here, give to them. And then I've been, in, I've been in conferences, I've been in events where I've had debt, and God has spoken to me, so I want to give a big offering to this person. I want to give a big offering to this ministry. And then you, you obey the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is outside the realms, you understand, of, of these things. And he's only doing that to increase you. But as just a normal, everyday thing, I say, okay, I'll cut back to get out of debt, to get out of um, you know, credit card debt, higher purchase debt, you know, the, you know, um, these types of, um, you know, um, buy now, pay later debt. Um, your mortgage is different because you'll be on that for years. And, but, that, but doing that will get you out of debt quicker. And then, then the next time the missionary comes along, you now want to give into that. Instead of just putting a small amount in, man, you can put a big amount in, knowing that that's your money that's going into them. You have more control. God does not want you to be a slave. So I will say that over those two things. So let's go into tithing then. And giving in the New Testament, praise God. Tithing in the New Testament. Um, so I've already, I've already sh showed my hand. I like tithing. I believe in tithing. Um, it's a controversial subject in, in, in the church these days. And one thing I will say is, judge a tree by its fruit. There are many ministers out there who are speaking against tithing. Judge a tree by its fruit. How are they doing? How, how is their ministry doing? Um, financially, how, the, how, how is their ministry doing? You know, you know, judge it by its fruit. You know, I met a man, and I've heard this from many different people who have had the same experience I had. When I was at Bible college, I had a man come and visit us from Texas. He was a preacher, Texas preacher, wore his cowboy hat. The man was in his 90s. He was preaching still. Tall cowboy guy. He had a wife. Um, she was a, is it, I don't know what they called now, the, she was British. He came over during the war. He took her back on the boat like a lot of the Americans did and stole our women. How, how, how about that? And they took him back. And, um, and she, she, she was fully American. That's what she's with the Lord now. And um, but I remember speaking with him because he was, man, he was preaching powerful stuff at 90. I was just in awe of this, this guy. And he said to me, he goes, man, he goes, he, you know, he spoke about things like speaking in tongues because I've never met you know, a fruitful ministry. That, did, that does not speak in tongues, that does not believe in speaking in tongues, that has miracles. And you know what? You can say the same for tithing. I think so many fruitful ministries have that root of tithing in them, that root of faithfulness in them. Now let's look. I've only got a few minutes here. So let's look at New Testament scriptures on tithing, not Old Testament, New Testament. Because the argument is, is that tithing is not in the New Testament. Is never encouraged. So, so let, let me read these to you. Matthew 
23, 23, it reads this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and aniseed and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the Lord, judgment, mercy and faith, is all you have to have done, and not to leave the other undone. That's one instance. The same account is in Luke eleven forty two, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. Is all you to have done, and to not leave the other undone. So we have tithe in reference there by Jesus. He, he does it twice, by the way. There's another scripture for this. And he's mentioned tithing. He's mentioned it. Now, he's mentioned it in a negative standpoint, as in, he's not said tithing is bad, but he said, all you guys do is tithe. Because you think that because you've given tithe to the middle school, which is not all, often a good, good sign of tithing, when, you, when, when you're tithing down to the absolute penny of what you're doing, and it's like, you tithe your mint and your cumin, because you're, you, you're that you know, meticulous with tithing to tick a box, because yet you're horrible to people. You, you, you don't have the love of God. You don't have mercy. You miss the weightier things. You miss the more important things. Now, I've met people like this. I met, man, I met some horrendous people. I met people when I was in Asda, of all places, people who actually literally bragged in front of me of how much they gave to God and how rude they were. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever come across in my life, somebody bragging in the supermarket how much they give to God and being rude about it. And, um, and Jesus was saying to them, guys, you're tithing but you're missing the rest of it. Where's the love of God in you? Where's the love of God in you? So he, he doesn't say, hey, stop tithing so much, but he says, why are you doing this when you're missing the great thing? He goes, really? Because you should be walking in the love of God. It's more important than the tithe that you're giving. Ideally, you'd be doing both with the heart after God. But that's the first instance of the New Testament we have of tithing from Jesus. And he's rebuking the Pharisees for saying, and you think you're okay because you're tithing, because you're not okay. Tithing won't get you into heaven. Tithing won't make you right with God. There is positives to tithing, but you guys are missing it. Luke eleven forty two. he says this. Sorry, Luke 18, 13. He says this. He's talking about a parable here. And you've got the, um, the, the publican and you've got the Pharisee. And he's talking about the publican here. Oh, you know what? I've taken the wrong scripture right here. Let me let me grab this on my uh, on my Bible, Luke chapter eighteen. I've only got one passage here, so let me just go back. Here we go. It's Luke chapter eighteen. Let's start in verse eleven. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed. Thus God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Man, this is, this is religion at its worst, when you're literally using all the good things you do, supposedly good things, to put down other people and put yourself above them. He says in verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Um, and we know from this story, this guy here, this Pharisee right here, who said, man, I fast twice a week. I tithe of everything that I get. And it says here, the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Well, so tithing does not justify you. Again, this is Jesus sharing tithing from a negative standpoint, you can say, of, um, of, a, of, a, of a Pharisee using tithing to justify himself. Tithing does not justify you, does not make you better than anyone else. It does not do that. It's never the purpose of it. And then the final, the final place where tithing is mentioned in the New Testament is Hebrews chapter 7. So that's, that's, that's the place you've got Matthew 23, Luke 11, Luke 18, Hebrews 7. That's the only places you'll find tithing mentioned in the New Testament. And so, so let me read this. I'm just going to read from the actual scriptures that's all about tithing, just because of the, um, the time I've got here. It says, Verily, 
in Luke, um, sorry, in Hebrews 7, verse 5, and verily they are they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brothers, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So he's talking about tithing here. But he whose descent is not counted from the received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. This is talking about Abraham and Melchizedek. Abraham, in Genesis, gave tithes to Melchizedek, the, um, the king of Salem, the king of peace. He gave tithes to him. And verse 8, And here that men die, and here men that die receive tithes. But there he receives of them whom it is witnessed that he lives. And as I may say so, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. You know, the teacher of Hebrews here, whoever it is, whether it's Paul, whether it's Barnabas, whoever you want to believe it is, he's just making a point here, and tithing is within the point. He's actually saying that, um, that Levi was a, you know, an Israelite tribe, a you know, tribe of Israel, came after Abraham, yet Levi existed in the loins of Abraham. Okay, just trying to get your head around that. I mean, we all existed in the loins of Adam in the garden. The whole world was inside Adam. That's why the whole world fell when Adam fell, because it was all within his loins. We've all come from Adam. But at that time, Levi existed in Abraham. And when Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, Levi also gave tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham. That's all. That's the only point that I'm making now, that's the only point, is that man, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. This is what the writer is saying right here. He's talking about Melchizedek and actually how Jesus is a type of Melchizedek. Now, I, I encourage you, when tithing, I'm sharing a little bit here. If you want to go back, go back to Hill Donations 2019 and find it on our church at Tree of Life Church and look up Benjamin Conway, look up his, his second message in that conference, it's on tithing. It's the best message on tithing I've heard. It's the best by far. I'm not, I'm not saying that because it's my pastor and I'm trying to get brownie points. I'm just being as honest as I can be. It's the best message on tithing that I, I have heard. And here's the thing. A lot of the arguments people have against tithing, they say, well, it's Old Testament, it's legalism. Well, you can see that the Pharisees were using it as legalism. You can see that. But Abraham was not. Abraham was not in legalism. Abraham was not even under law. Abraham was living under grace at that time. The law had not been given. Levi did not, was not born. And that law, the, the tribe of Levi, the priests, they didn't exist yet. Abraham existed. He came back, the spoils of war. He met Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Melchizedek, we don't know where he came from. And he never stopped being a priest, it says here. You read it in Hebrews 7. It's a fantastic chapter to read. And Abraham gave him tithes. He gave him tithes. Why? Because in Hebrews 7, here, it's taken, talking about that Melchizedek is like Jesus. He's the king of peace. We don't know where he's come from so much. He's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, is what it says in Hebrews 7. Abraham gave tithes to Jesus. And whether you believe Melchizedek was a type of Jesus or whether you believe that was Jesus himself who appeared in the Old Testament to Abraham and Abraham gave tithes to Jesus. It's up to you. I, 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 I'm really not bothered. Either way, in my heart, he gave tithes to Jesus, whether that was the type or whether that was Jesus himself. Abraham gave a tithe to Jesus. And people say, well, you know what? That's still wrong because this, here's what they say. <laughs> well, if if you're still teaching tithing from the perspective that Abraham gave it outside of the law, Abraham was circumcised. So, so do we all have to be circumcised? Again, I will say this. The people who are teaching these things, look at their fruit of their ministry. Look at it, okay, honestly. Look, is it producing healthy people? Is it producing healthy teaching? Because the people I know who teach tithing in the right way, not in the legalistic way, not saying if you don't tithe to this church, and, you know, your washing machine is going to break. You know, your wife's going to leave you. You know, there's going to be a hole in your roof. Now, that's, that's ungodly. That's wrong. That's unbiblical. 
but the people who teach it in a wholesome way say, man, you know what? You're just you're doing Deuteronomy 8 18. You remember the Lord your God. You take, you take the very first thing that you have out of your wage and you give it to him, you know, and you honor him. You remind yourself that you're a steward of his money. I'm telling you, those people are healthy. I've met so many of them. They're so healthy at their ministries. But the people who say, man, you know what? Why don't we all get circumcised then? Because that's not even biblical. Because, you know, here's two scriptures that will help with that. Philippians 3.3 3 says this. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision, is what Paul writes in Philippians 3.3. 3. There's no reason to be circumcised anymore because we are literally the circumcision. We are the circumcision. Romans 2.29, it says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Even for a Jewish person now, in Romans, Paul is saying, actually, the physical side of um, circumcision is not the issue now. It's the heart that needs to be circumcised. It's the heart that needs to be, it's the heart that needs to be cut back and needs to be open to God. That's what needs to, be, to happen. And he says in Philippians that we are the circumcision. You cannot show me a scripture in the New Testament where it says that we are the tithe. You can't find them. It's not there. I've, I've showed you literally every scripture in the New Testament that speaks about tithing. And you cannot find anywhere it says we are the tithe in the same way it says we are the circumcision. It does not make any sense. The circumcision has been fulfilled. They had to do it physically back then because the hearts of men were not ready for the, to be born again. But once you're born again, you are the circumcision, praise God. Your heart, your heart of stone has been turned into a heart of flesh. You've been born again. So that argument doesn't, very, doesn't hold up very well, praise God. But you know what? Tithing to Jesus is a good thing. Taking the first of your money. And here's the thing, here's the thing I will say. I think there's a reason the New Testament does not explicitly say thou must tithe. And it does not explicitly say thou must not tithe. It doesn't say either. Because the New Testament is very different from the Old. The Old Testament is very, um, you know, you must do this, otherwise you've broken the law. The New Testament is you get to do this. No one makes you do anything. No one makes you love other people. No one makes you, you know, pray for people. No one makes you walk in the love of God. No one makes you, you know, fellowship with God on a daily basis. No one makes you read your Bible. No one makes you pray. And no one makes you tired, not even God. And God is saying, hey, look, I'm leaving this up to you. I'm leaving this up to you. I'm not giving you a direct thing to say, yes, you have to do it. And then again, I'm not saying you must not do this. It's a hard issue. And what I will say is, though, for me personally, it's been a blessing. It's helped me discipline myself. So every month, remind myself, man, God is my provider. And God looks after me. And I've, I've got friends, I've got family who come up to me and say, man, I've been tithing for years. At the beginning, I, I wasn't happy. But when I open my heart to it, and God has blessed us so much. God has increased us so much. Often it's the heart of why you're doing it is what is important. And that's why I, don't, do not, I believe that God has not made it explicit. You know, you must do this or you must not do this. He's saying, where's your heart in all of this? But... So, you know, and in Hebrews, you can see in chapter 7, Abraham gave to either Jesus or somebody who was Jesus. And some people ask, you know, well, why do we have to give it to the church? Why can't I give it to Jesus? Because the church is the body of Christ. It should be the first place that you are looking to put your tithe into. It should be the first place. If you are not in a good church, and that's, that's very... Um, what people define a good church is some people define a good church that has to be 100 percent perfect and exactly how they want it well good luck with that you'll never find one but you find a place where you know there is good teaching good worship a good heart but in a place where you also have the heart to serve praise god it's not all about you receiving it's about you giving into the church and you know giving your talents giving your your heart into that church but you find a place like that and you tie into it you give into it. It's important. It's the body of Christ. You are given to Jesus. When Paul, in the book of Acts, was persecuting the church, 
Jesus met Paul at, at the road of Damascus and he said, Saul, which was his name back then, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus took it personally. When someone came against the church, Jesus took it personally. Listen, when you give to the church, Jesus takes it personally. He literally receives that and says, thank you very much. In the same way that Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes and it was received, in the same way when you give it to church, God receives you. Oh, but that church, they don't, look, they don't look after that money well enough, or they don't do everything I would like them to do with that money. But you get your heart right and, and have the vision that whether they do something right with it or wrong with it, God receives that money. God sees your heart in that situation. And if it's that bad, if it's that immoral, what's going on in that church, then you move on to another one. You pray to God and say, Lord, let me leave this in the right way and go into another church the right way and be led by the spirit, not by the flesh or by being discontent, like I said earlier. And man, but you know what? Here's the thing. In Matthew 6, 21, it says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You cannot tell me, all right, if this is just theology, but you cannot tell me that you are invested in a church, that you support a church and you support the vision of it if you're not willing to financially give into that church in a, in a serious manner. And again, you know, and, and, and where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. If you say your heart is with the church, then your money will be with the church as well. Not all your money, of course, but you'll be giving, you'll be tithing. You will be investing within that church because your heart will be there. You say, oh, yeah, my heart's in the church, but I don't give into that church. Well, then that's not true because this scripture says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, I, I don't like a lot of TV. It winds me up. But there's one program I do like, and that's Dragon's Den. Uh, Dragon's Den is where they have, I think it's in America. I think it's here. In, I know it's here in the UK. They have like four or five people they call dragons. They're like business owners, entrepreneurs. They're worth millions. And they've got money. I don't know why. I don't know who was saying this. Like, what, why do they, when the program starts, they have like a load of cash in front of them, which is ridiculous. They're not just going to give somebody a load of cash. But they have these five dragons, these people. They're not real dragons. And somebody, an entrepreneur, an inventor, a business owner, will do a pitch in front of them and pitch their product, pitch their idea, and ask for investment. And if the idea is good enough and they pitch it, and, you know, and, and, and the dragons then one of them like it, they'll make it an offer for an investment and they make an agreement. And yeah, lots of good things have come out of it. Um, my favorite thing to come out of it is reggae, reggae sauce. Man, I love that stuff. Praise God. And um, that guy was on Dragon's Den. But anyway, there was a guy one time who went on there. And this is what happened. And this is why I say it's important to know numbers. Because somebody has a great idea. They go, oh, yeah, I've got this new product. It does this, it does that. And, oh, that's really good. That's amazing. And one of them, one of the dragons, I can think of one in particular, it's a guy. He goes, tell me about your finances. What's your, you know, what's your turnover? Um, how much money do you take out the business? How much have you invested? And there's often where a lot of these deals falter because people just don't have the finances in place. You know, that somebody can't answer straight up, you know, this was our turnover in the last year or two years. It's not a good sign. They don't know the money. They don't know where the money is. But this one time they had this guy who had this brilliant idea. But when they asked him about his finances, it turns out the guy was stinking rich already. He already had other businesses and he was, and he, he had not invested a penny of his own money. And I remember watching this. I remember these investors that were talking to him got so mad. And they were like, why on earth should I invest my money into your business when you don't even believe in it enough to invest your own money into it? With all the money you had. And literally, they all just got angry. And that was it. No one invested in this guy. They said, man, if you believe in this that much, you will put your money into it. You'll put your money where your mouth is. And that was it. That was the end of that deal. And um, I, I would say that with church as well, man. If you believe in where you are, if you believe it's from God, if you believe, man, I want, you know, I believe this church is going to do great things. I believe, you know, you're changing lives. Then, it, then surely you put your money into them. Surely you put your your money where your mouth is and um, i'm telling you it helps as well every time you every time i do tithing it helps me it kills the love of money in my life because i'm giving it away that's, that's the easiest way to deal with greed it's just to give money away praise god and to see the blessing it brings in other people's lives
Awesome. Let me let me wind down with one more scripture. So Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And praise God. Where are we? Oh, I'm in Luke already. That's why I can't see. Luke chapter 16. Let me read this parable. I'll get this done. I'll get this done. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. I said this last week. The man wasn't stealing. The man wasn't doing unethical things with the money. He was wasting it. God doesn't like waste. He hates waste. Okay, this is why this guy was pulled up because he was wasting. He called him and said, what is it that I hear about you? Turn in your account of your management. For you can no, no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do. So when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. He cut it in half. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it falls, that they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Here's the thing. The guy actually got it into his mind. It's not about me. Let me look after other people. That's what was commended of him. He was shrewd in that he looked after other people. And there's a joy when money's not all about us. It's about other people. And it goes back to the first teaching we started with. It's not my money. It's God's money. And God's money is always about other people. God's heart is always about other people. But in verse 10, it says this, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, he will give you that which is your own. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So I'm going to finish with this. Is that here, it's that he who is faithful with very little. You know, in the King James, if I read that to you, this is in the ESV, in the King James it says, he that is faithful, which is least, is faithful, is also faithful, in much and he that is unjust in the least is unjust in much if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon we will commit to you your trust the true riches you know the ladder of god the ladder of maturity the ladder of going up in the things of god the bottom rung the first step of the ladder is finances it says here he that is faithful in the least he talks about unrighteous mammon if we're not willing to be faithful in the least, uh, especially now people who have got a call to a ministry, you feel you have called to ministry, um, be faithful in your finances. That's the first step. Yeah, but I've got, I've got to work in the gifts of the spirit. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to teach. I've got, man, no, you've got to be faithful in your finances. You have to be faithful. It's the least thing. It's the thing that you begin with. So many Christians think, oh, you know what? I'll skip that because that's not spiritual enough. We're just going to praying and, you know, and seeking God in other ways. But we'll leave out, but, you know, we'll cut out finances. No, you can't do that. It's the least thing. It's the least thing. And God says, man, if you can't be faithful in finances, how can I give you true riches? What are true riches? True riches are people. There's, there's no richer, greater than people. We are more precious than anything on earth. But it starts with money. If I can show that I'm faithful with money, and this is why I believe timing is good, because it's consistent. See, every month I get in that habit of taking 10% and giving it to God. It's a consistent faithfulness. Only if I do it in the right heart. If I'm doing it and I'm hating it, I'm hating God, I'm hating the church, and you know what? That's not for you. You know what? 
you need to work on your heart on that and say, Lord, help me with that. Help me be faithful with this. But God is looking for faithfulness. He really is. It's not about charisma. It's not about, you know, being the most eloquent person, whatever it is you want to do in life. But it's about faithfulness. And money is one of the great ways that you can show faithfulness to God. And so this is why I, I think tithing is still important today. This is why I personally will, will preach it and share it because I've seen the, the great benefits it's brought into my life and I've seen it in other people. And I believe it's a healthy thing to do just to be consistently faithful to God. Okay, my time is up. Thank you so much for joining um, here. Next week, um, I'm going to be going into increase. You know, we spoke about kind of cutting back. We spoke about being a good steward. Now, I God wants you to multiply. He wants you to increase. I'm going to talk about giving and seed sowing, but also practically increase what things you can do for that. Practical things, praise God. Let's finish in prayer. Father, I just thank you right now. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's listening to this. Who set time, who sacrificed time, Lord, to, to, to invest in their finances, Lord, to increase in these areas. Father, I thank you for this, Lord. That, Lord, that this time will be multiplied back to them. That, Lord, that they will gain more wisdom than ever. When I open your word, Lord, that you will speak to them about finances, Father. And open doors to them that will close before. And that, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that debt that we spoke about is eliminated in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, as we take that step, as we take that step to say, okay, I'm going to challenge my debt aggressively, that, Lord, supernaturally you'll come alongside us and it will be gone so quick that, that we will just be gobsmacked. We will just be speechless about what you have done in our lives, Lord, and we will work with you every step of the way. And I just pray, Lord, that we show that faithfulness that you are looking for, Lord, that we are faithful men and women. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining. Um, yeah, have a wonderful day and uh, God bless you.